If you want to turn in your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter number 3. But you'll find in Psalms 95, it was quoted in Hebrews number 3. And um, we're in this series called uh, Choosing Victory. Choosing Victory. And I wanted to, to highlight both uh, Psalms 95 and, and Hebrews 3. This is the third part in this series called Choosing Victory. Some people have a hard time believing that victory is a choice. Some people actually see it more like a fate. It's, uh, it's already a, a, a complete done, and, and they just see that, you know, you may think your life is by chance. But they think uh, maybe it's uh, just all a done deal, but it's not. It's choice. God's Word says that He places before us uh, good and evil, and we can choose what those things may be. And I pray that we, today and next Sunday, can hear the completeness of what the New Testament and the Old Testament put together as a great picture of how we need to walk our life. We can choose victory. And if we so choose victory, the God of victory will be there to help us every step of the way. Stand up with me in honor of reading God's Word. We're going to look in Hebrews 3 first in verse number 7. Hebrews 3, verse number 7. This is also quoted in Psalms 95, but we'll get there in a minute. Hebrews 3, verse 7 says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, God's voice, the whisper that can come to you directly to your heart, and you know it's Him, you know His voice, and you know the encouragement that comes from it. He says, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath. This is God saying, I'm, I'm, I'm making a vow on the truth of my heart. He said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest any of you be in, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said today. If you will hear His voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was He angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did He swear that they would not enter His rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's a powerful statement right there. They could not enter in because of unbelief. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. It's not just to make us feel good. It's to, for us to be blessed so that we could hear Your truths, that which comes from Your divine nature. Lord, we know Your Word tells us that You have plans of good for us. You have chosen good for us. You love us with an everlasting love. You do not want to withhold from us. So You tell us the way in which we should go. But Lord, when we choose defeat, Lord, when I choose unbelief, You can't bless that. I pray, Lord, that today we would choose belief. 
and enter your rest. Father, I pray for an ability by the power of the Holy Spirit not only to hear your word, but to understand your word and to be drawn to the truth of your word and to the truth of your heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. They could not enter into the promised land. And he says it plainly and simply, it was because of unbelief. Unbelief is poison to a Christian. We hope we have enough belief so that we can have salvation. But we're not quite sure that we have enough active belief in our life to walk out what that salvation really is. That's kind of a dissonance, isn't it? We say that we believe. We hope we have enough belief that will, that will get us over the tipping point of salvation. And yet, as we face the circumstances of life, we're not really sure that we have enough belief in God, enough understanding of God to walk the victory that God has placed so plainly before us. Psalms 95 was written by King David because he understood the battle that was being fought for the soul. And he, he understood that the battle that was fought for the soul, soul had to be fought before the battle began. It was won or lost before it was ever fought. David, who led the people, and by the way, led them well, and he led them from victory to victory to victory. Never one time, in one time, not one time, in defeat. And yet, he understood that the battle belonged to the Lord. He understood that that battle happened in his heart of belief before the battle ever began. So he pinned down a song. Now, I understand when we come to church, we sing. And Mark is, we, they have titles that they've changed over the years. See if y'all know any of these titles. He's the song leader. Or he's the choir director. Then we got to be a professional and he became the, the minister of music. He has the ministry of music. Only problem with that is, is that title is already being given. The Holy Spirit is the minister of music. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And he, he, we were designed and created to be able to share from our heart. And singing should come from our heart thing is, is that I hear some people sing some things today. And by the way, it doesn't matter the style. Some are drawn to country or country and western. Some are led to, and by the way, if your phone's on, you can go ahead and turn it off for the next few minutes. I uh, if it's the Lord, Bob, we need to put that sign back up there. Everybody comes in and we got our phones with us all the time and we forget those things. All right? So uh, I didn't mean to shame anybody. I don't know who it actually was. So was it you, Brother Mark? Is it turn if, it come if it comes on, I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. I'll throw it at you. Now that we've gotten totally off track here, Right? That, and I'm talking about ministering of the music, and all of a sudden the music went off in the church service. Maybe that was a word of the Holy Spirit there, you know? But listen, listen. The, the thing is, is that it, it doesn't matter the style. Some of you, if I said rap, you would go, what? Like you got hit or something. By the way, it's not my cup of tea either. Matter of fact, my cup of tea might not be your cup of tea. And, and, and even in Christian circles, with all the styles that are out there, listen to me now, music is defined by the style. God forbid. The world of the radio is presenting a, a, a doctrine out there 
And people chase the style and listen to the song because they like the style. Any of y'all ever watch American Bandstand? This is my group here. Y'all are my age. Y'all remember American Bandstand? And, and what was his name? Dave, Dave Porter? Man, the guy, I don't know what he was drinking, but he never aged, did he? And they used to have a time back in the 60s and 70s when they'd, they'd get somebody up there and, and they'd sing, a, they'd have a new song and they'd grade out the new song. Y'all remember that? And, and, and then they would say these words. They'd stick the microphone in this teenager's mouth and, and, and tell me what you think about this song. Well, I, I like the beat. Did y'all ever hear that? I like the beat. And that's basically all they could tell you about it. But there's a lot of, of doctrine that's preached in, by the world in the, in the tune of songs. But you see, David was a shepherd. And out there, quietly with the sheep, bored stiff, and he became a great writer of music. And it wasn't what he heard, the top 40 on the Jerusalem countdown over the radio. It was simply his heart looking up into the stars of the Almighty and singing praise and worship unto him. And it came from the truth of how God had revealed himself to them and then he sang it back to God. In Psalms 95, you can flip over there if you want. In Psalms 95, you see these words, and he begins this, this psalm as a song of praise that led to worship. Praise is always lifting up. Praise is, is, is full of excitement. It, it is a statement of belief of, of how glad you are to have a God, and it's singing praise unto Him. It's uplifting your spirit unto Him. Listen to Psalms 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let your heart, literally what he's saying, let your heart be so in tune with Him that a song springs forth from your, the bowels of your being. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Hold on now. Shout joyfully. Where did we get so dignified? We come to worship and we have to do it in a way that is decent and not offensive. I would rather offend you than I would him. And maybe we've gotten so dignified in our praise that our praise never even happens when we gather together. You may be quiet. My father was a quiet man. He was a dignified man. He was a man that was a, a, a brilliant man and a, a great orator, and he was... He, he, he had an unbelievable ability to teach and preach the Word of God. Couldn't sing a lick. But I tell you what, he could lift up his voice unto the Lord. And he loved to hear others who could do it as well. And there's something about when someone is praising God that it is contagious so he says let us sing let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation we've got something that we're standing upon that needs to come forth look what it says let us come before his presence with thanksgiving we need to remember what god's done for us you need to remember the loving hand of god who was there with you we all have testimonies to the goodness of God. And when we think about those things, words should come past our lips 
with our voice shouting them out, saying, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We need to let them come. Let them come into his presence. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms in our songs. How long has it been since you've been to one of those services where joy broke out? Brother Mark, I've been to some when I was there to preach and never opened my Bible. I've been in some services when God showed up and we didn't have time for the preaching of the Word because the joy of the Lord was so full in its midst. I love to preach. I love to preach. I'd rather preach than eat. But listen to me well. I would, I would joyfully give over my time if the Holy Spirit broke out in the hearts of His people and the joy of the Lord could not be contained, but God's people needed to sing and shout in joy together. And David said, this is important. He says very plainly that the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Can you hear His his, his respect and his love for God here. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, that's the depths, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land. O come, O come, New Holland. O come, you dignified ones. O come, let us worship and bow down. Listen to me now. Some people will chase the praise. But if it's true praise, and praise is important, true praise will always lead to worship. Praise is to lift up. The word worship means bow down. You see, there's something when we're thinking about the goodness of God and we're shouting the goodness of God and we're praising God high and lifted up upon the throne of glory that it, there's something that now happens within us and when we see ourselves against the greatness of God, we are knocked to our knees in worship. Oh, He is so great and so high and so wonderful. And as the old hymn writer said, and who am I? but a worm. Oh God, I'm not the author of worship. I, I, I'm not the one that needs to be praised. I'm not the one that needs man's applause. I'm not the one that needs all the things that this world has. Lord, all this belongs to you. I simply come and lower myself before you. I, I, I'm grateful to know that, that I am known by you, that you know me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, and yet your love is there with me. Oh God, what a pleasure to know you. Oh God, to be cleansed and be called a child of God. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. He is our God. We are the people of His pasture, the sheep. Of his hand. Listen, we're just dumb, stupid sheep. But we're sheep in the hand of God. And the sheep don't know where to go, but God will lead them there. And the circumstances of life that battle against us, that lead us to unbelief, is a wrong view of an almighty God. We need to understand that if we're there, God is with us there. Come on. We need to understand that God's not out of control just because you think the world's out of control. And you might not like the circumstances, but the shepherd's got his hand upon you. And circumstances will lead to your unbelief but praise and worship and the true understanding of an almighty God will lead you to true belief that is greater than your circumstances. So, let's go back to Hebrews 3. Because literally verse 7 
picks up in Hebrews 3, and we see it together there again. <clears throat> There's a voice that we need to listen to. Whose voice are you listening to? Look what it says in verse 3. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit has said, today, by the way, God only meets you in the right now. You're only going to have a connection with God if you stay in the right now. So many Christians are living in the yesterday. And they're trying to go back to yesterday where they connected with God before. You cannot connect with God but in the right now. You're looking in the future so that all these circumstances can be different, so that if all the stars line up just right, then you'll connect with God. Never happens. You can only meet God in the right now. I used to say when I was a young kid, I said, Lord, if you let me grow up, I'll be the greatest servant for you. I never wanted to be a preacher. I said, Lord, I'll serve in the church. I'll give in the church. I'll be faithful in the church. Brother Mark, I even said, I'll sing in the church. One day, Lord, if you'll do those things, I'll, I'll, I'll do all the, I'll be a soul winner. And I come to find out you'll never be any of those things unless you're willing to be those things today. He said, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, in, in the days of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. In, in verse 7 and 8 and 9, he is talking about Exodus chapter <clears throat> number 17. You may remember it by, by the time when the children of Israel were out in the wilderness and they did not have water. So when they did not have water, they got angry and they got mad because of their circumstances. And who did they get mad at? They got mad at God, but they got mad indirectly at God because they got mad at Moses. <clears throat> Y'all look at me. We sound so high and mighty, but the battle is always against another human being. We would never say we're mad with God, would we? That would sound sacrilegious. But we're always mad at somebody. Whomever is, is the ire in our life, that's really, that person just turns our crank and we're just, so, Lord, if you just deal with them. And they got angry with <clears throat> Moses. <clears throat> Let me quote Exodus 17, verse 3. This is not on the screen. You're going to have to listen to me. Why is it you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? By the way, they wouldn't have got out of Egypt if it wasn't for God. And they had no livestock if it were not for God. But they're just mad because they're thirsty and they're blaming God for their circumstances. And, and they're saying, you don't love us. You don't care. We get, we get in our circumstances and this happens or this happens. And the very first thing we do is out of a, a, a heart of unbelief of knowing who God is and that God is in control, we start to get mad at the world and we'll find somebody to pinpoint. And they found Moses. And in Exodus 17, by the way, God gave them water, but he didn't forget it. He said, Massa and Meribah, saying, is the Lord among us or not? When you get to Hebrews 3 here, when it says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, the word rebellion, provocation, an irritation. It is the word Masa that we saw in the Old Testament in Exodus 17. When he said to those people, as they were angry because they did not have water, he said, I call this rebellion, I call it Masa. Meribah, in the day of trial in the wilderness. Do you think God's going to let us go through trials? It's a test. It's a test of belief. Now, 
please hear me. When you look at the facts, did they have water? No. Were they thirsty? Yes. And I am told that one of the greatest desires that we have is to have our thirst quenched. That's the facts. But it's not the truth. The facts are, they didn't have water, but the truth was, God, the provider, was already there. So instead of looking to God in praise for God taking care of us and providing for us and bowing down in worship of Him, they got angry and they got mad because the facts said something that, that their heart could not conceive and, and they, they, they moved in unbelief of God's provision. Let's go on. Where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Verse 10. Therefore I was angry with that generation. I said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Their heart is leading them this way, but the truths of my ways they're not grasping. Misery always loves company. I wrote these words three weeks ago in my notes. Be very careful. Satan always wants to lead us in a chorus of contention. We look, we think we see all the truths, and we're angry and we're willing to tell it to anybody that will listen. I call this the evangelism of bad news. The gospel is the evangelism of good news. But there's always somebody, misery desires company, that, that they want to get everybody else caught up in their misery too. And, and they, they're very willing to preach their, their bad news to anybody that will listen. Be very careful here because you will be contaminated by their unbelief. Belief will bring more belief. When you're around of people who are encouragers in belief, your heart will be encouraged to believe. But if you're around people who are the, the, the tellers of unbelief and untruth and, and, and they're always going to tell you what's wrong with everybody and there's always somebody they're going to tell you about that person about. Be very, very careful. Be very, very careful because you're going to be led astray. I hope the Holy Spirit hits hearts here because God did not allow them to enter the promised land because of such. He sent in 12 spies. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua. Oh, Caleb, he spoke up. Let's go! He, bless God, let, he's got it here for us. Let's go! But 10 of the spies, oh, 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 oh my soul. Man, that's a beautiful land. Truly flowing with milk and honey. True. Walled cities. Man, there's one city there named Jericho. They've got walled cities so large that you can race chariots around the top of that wall. And there are warriors. And there are giants that are there. By the way, every one of the things that I just told you that those spies said, every one of them was true. Was it beautiful? Was the fruit amazing? Were there walled cities? Were these people of war? Were there giants, the sons of Anak there? I guarantee old Caleb's like, man, this is good. Wow, I, I believe that's the place where, the, where those giants are. Man, that's the place I want to call home. That's going to be my part. By the way, 40 years later, <laughs> that's the land he got. Amen? 
He's walking through it and said, man, my house is going to look right there. It's going to be so great. Woo, this is going to be wonderful. But the others are going, can you believe this? Did you see those giants? Did you see those implements of war? How in the world are we supposed to compete with these? They began to talk and murmur. You just don't come back and say that. Forty days they were there. You know they were talking amongst each other. The evangelism of the bad news. Yeah, this would be good, but. It was true, but God. Aren't you grateful that God looks at you, dirty, rotten sinner that you are, and he could say all kinds of truth in there, couldn't he? Undeserving of hell. Not deserving anything that came from the blessed hand of God's grace. But aren't you grateful that he says, but God, who is rich in mercies towards us? (laughs) One looks and believes what they see. But worship helps us see God through false truth. How did they come to the conclusion? Just here in the negativity. I got a word I want to share with you from uh, Romans chapter 16. This is uh, Paul writing to the church in Rome. And as he gets to the end of this letter, He says these words. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. Contrary to the doctrine which you learned. Notice these words. And avoid them. Some translations say, mark those. You know them. The, 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 evangelist, the evangelist of the bad news, you better know them. Be very careful. They will bring divisions. And by the way, that's what they want. They want everybody to know that they're miserable and that who they're going to blame for it. Verse 18, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly That means their own desires. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. He says, for your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Now here, verse 20. This is the money. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It is true, so be it. Amen. Don't listen to them. Don't let them take you away from the truth of the Word of God. In Hebrews 3, Verse 12, he says, Beware, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Don't let your view of God change. Be people of belief. Don't look at the circumstances and let that create an evil heart within you. An evil heart, he says, of unbelief. But he says, encourage one another daily. Instead of all the tearing apart that Satan wants to do, he did it with Eve, did he not? He did it with the ten spies, did he not? And an entire nation followed. I've heard it called those 40 years in the wilderness the longest funeral service in the history of the world. He said, but encourage each other daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. It is deceitful. 
it will sneak up on you. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Don't change. While it is said today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Lastly, I say again, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Next Sunday, I'll spend my time talking about, and they shall not enter my rest, and what that means. But let me just pause here and just say, what David said was spot on. Instead of having the habitual negativity that leads you not to trust God, what we need is habitual praise. What we need is not something that, that follows the wisdom of a person who is murmuring and uncontent. By the way, whether it's the preacher or anyone else, but to follow the whisper of the Holy Spirit who will lead you if you choose to believe. There is a great God. He is all-powerful. He has been mighty good to us. And His grace is so very prevalent. They had grace from the day that they left Egypt to the day 40 years later they entered the Promised Land. The grace never changed. They just needed to change their outlook. Praise will lead you to worship. Preacher, what are you saying? Praise will keep the truths of God before you, which will lead you to bowing down to serve Him. So that when the temptation comes, when the conflict comes, when the circumstances are hard, instead of running for the false truths, we understood that God is something greater involved here. I might not understand it fully yet, but yet I know God is in charge. It's a choice. I had a friend of mine call me last week. Uh, uh, that's, that's not true. He, he, he texted me, but then he, I saw him this week, and he was speaking to me. He, he, he's not a church member. Um but he watches us online. So I'll wave at him. He said, man, you got after it last week, didn't you? I said, did I? So I went to Mark and I said, my friend told me, man, I, was, I said, did I get after it last week? I didn't think I got after it last week. Mark said, you were very passionate, which is his kind way of saying I got after it. Maybe I got after it this morning. I don't know. But I'm tired of seeing Christians under the sway of the negativity that Satan loves to lead us away from a loving God. By the way, who's been there for us? We just have to choose it. And if we do, we choose victory. And if we don't, 